Welcome to the On Labs podcast. Our special guest today is Tongi Herman. Now, this is a gentleman that I've known for about a decade. I would say that Tongi, you're one of the first people I met uh, when I started going to Europe um, for Go conferences. And um, I, it always brings a smile to my face when you walk into the room uh, when I'm overseas. So uh, I really appreciate you spending a a dedicated hour and a half with me. This is awesome. I'm I'm very happy too. Very honored. Give everybody that's listening the one minute um, sort of background on what you're doing today. Just today. What, what what's keeping you busy? Yeah, what's keeping okay. you busy every every day? Just in IT or in general? In general, your life in general. A, a little bit about the work you're doing, but. Well, okay. What keeps you busy? So today I'm ex quite excited because I started a project yesterday that I wanted to do 10 years ago, but then life happened, uh, life happened and I got kids and they kept me busy for quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so my side project, do my side project went uh, on the side. Uh, so I finally uh, started my Foho dance, which is like a Brazilian dance. Uh, in Strasbourg, the city I'm around, and uh, because we didn't have distance there, so I always had to go drive in Germany or Switzerland to go there or go in Paris uh, to Paris. Uh, so yeah, I did that yesterday. It was the first one. People showed up, and we had a great time. The weather was wonderful, so it was a really really nice time. Uh, so I'm gonna start this. So it's gonna be a, a big side gig for me uh, in the next uh, few weeks, maybe months. Uh, so yeah, that's it. And also, I'm also excited because I started uh, working with a friend uh, like a week and a half ago uh, on the blockchain technology. And I've already worked with him on the past on blockchain technology as well. And so it's nice because he's really good at that. He really knows his uh, the domain and stuff. He, he knows every actors and stuff. So it's really nice and um, uh, let's say... Um, it's a learning experience <laughs> to be with him. Well, you know, anytime you start playing with any sort of new tech, um, you go through levels of like first frustration because you don't know anything, right? Uh, and then excitement as you start to figure it out and get things to work. And this blockchain stuff, I spent a year learning it. Tech-wise, some of it's really fascinating stuff, um, really interesting Uh stretches computer science to to levels that i hadn't i've never had to work on before um so that was that was kind of cool uh, i just haven't seen any real demand for it from a company perspective so we kind of i kind of lost interest in it but i think you're going to really enjoy all the sort of tech that that sits behind it yes yes and, and, and what I like about blockchain as well, it's not only technical. There is also like game theory you, you need to add in some of the algorithm to make sure that there is no bad actors or they are moved into doing the right thing because of the algorithm put in place. So, so yeah, and the social part of it, the, yeah, it's, it's really very, very technical and very deep. You can like go in ver uh, in a lot of uh, verticals of uh, domains in blockchain and get lost in there. And each of them have a lot of innovation in it. So so that's why my, my friend has spent like nearly a decade just doing, um, uh, not, not survey, just uh, being in the environment and following whatever was happening. And he didn't sleep a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so, but but he kind of stopped doing that because it got even crazier and crazier. Um, but he knows enough now that is a uh, is like a kind of known uh, there. So, so it's good to have him as a friend to have any question to ask him. But I love that you're balancing that with the dancing because I know that you love dancing. I love when I see videos. Sometimes you post videos of um, the dancing, and we're gonna. I want to explore that for sure. You know how to you. I'm assuming because of the other dancing you're doing, you know, you know, the, the traditional New York Latin salsa and all that stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I know more the yeah. Miami style actually. Uh, okay. So, That's fair. So, so Cuban style and, uh, New York a little less. Um, and it's, uh, was mostly about community. 
at least in France, uh, the community people were a little bit different and they were w more welcoming in the, we call it Cuban style in uh, France and not Miami style, but yeah. And um, so, so, so that's where my heart uh, went to for, for the salsa part. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, I do. I, I, I enjoy many dances. I started like years ago and I learned so many dances. I'm not the best at all of them for sure. But I, I just enjoy enjoying dancing. So we're gonna have to the next time we're together with my wife in the right city, sneak off and find one of these underground dance clubs, man. And like my wife doesn't know traditional salsa, but she's Latin and she can got the rhythm. Follow along, yes, with the right person that's leading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, no, no, the <laughs> rhythm's all good. I know like two or three little moves. So if I go slow enough. I'm not the fast one. I'm like the old man. Just go slow so you look cool and you stay under control. <laughs> so you, you need to learn son. And then you, you're you like the old Cuban people dancing very stylishly yeah. to a slower beat. Yeah. The, the old men are the best, dude. The old men. I don't care how fast the beat is. The old men just go out there at their own pace and it looks cool. I've went uh, to Cuba and uh, I've seen, an, I danced with an old lady. She was 84, 85. She was all like crumpled. And then I started doing a pass and she just like kicked in front, like throw her leg like 90 <laughs> degrees in front like that. Like, yeah, like, okay. <laughs> I was not expecting that, but that was amazing. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Yeah. I, uh, Maybe after I retire, I'll try to go. I was taking classes for like a couple months. And um, the real problem is I didn't have a partner. So at some point, my teacher said, you need to bring a partner in because you can only dance with your instructor, you know, for so long. Right. He was a male instructor. So at some point it, it just. But whatever. I mean, it's all good. I, I, I just love that aspect of you sort of doing that. I, I think it's so important to have something else other than your sort of job that, that sort of gives you that balance. Yeah. And that seems true. to do that for you. Oh, yes, it did. It did. It does. We're, we're going to jump into the time machine. I, I want to kind of explore um, a little bit how you got to this sort of place in your career, you know, your tech journey here. So a couple of questions sort of to start. Um, where did you grow up? And um, what year was it when you finished your sort of high school right before, let's say you, you would have went to university. Like what year is that? So that was um, high school. I finished at in 2001. Um, so that was a while ago. And, um, and I lived around this area actually where I live, like uh, I guess 10 kilometers from here. Uh, so I'm really around my hometown. And uh, so I still see my friends that I know since I'm four years old or something like that. Um, I, um, yeah, and I guess uh, that's enough because then I know I need to control myself. And that's France, right? I'm assuming. <laughs> yes, it's France. I'm it's around Strasbourg. France yeah, right it's now. around okay. Strasbourg. I didn't say that. Okay. It's around Strasbourg. Okay, 10, 10, 15 kilometers from Strasbourg. You still know people. The, the, the person, I have one friend that I still talk to from high school. I, technically, I went to kindergarten with him. Okay. So, but that's it. And one person from college that I still, I, I would argue regularly, at least talk to once a year, but that's it, man. Like you've got more than like, say one person that you still talk to from those early, early years. Uh, from really early for four years old, I only have my friend who is my dentist and my family dentist. And um, then it's more people from high school, uh, middle school. I didn't, uh, I, I kept some contact from middle school, uh, but then it was a little bit more high school that I keep more in touch with. And then people uh, from, from the university and I mean, after, after high school, IT in general. I, I was never somebody that was in a, I'm going to use the word click or group. I was always somebody that was in friends with everybody, mm -hmm. but not necessarily um, engaged heavily in like one group or the other. And I always 
felt like that's probably why I didn't really maintain long lasting relationships after high school, after college and, and sort of, were you the, the same thing or did you just have a core group of friends and that's who you hung out with? So I really had a core group of friends uh, till middle school uh, because they were in the same village. We would do like uh, street hockey, you know, on roller, inline rollers and stuff like that. Um, I did judo for a while as well uh, with one of my friends till 14 years old. Um, and, um, and they were cousin, uh, two of them were cousin, and they were my best friend. And then in middle school, basically, we got split because we were in the same class, in the same class. Uh, so when we got into middle school, we got split, all three of us, and the other went to another middle school. And so we got split up. So we still saw each other during, you know, like the... Um, recreation time i don't uh time out i guess or the break the breaks yeah, yeah, yeah during, the breaks during the breaks school yeah and and then uh my friend the dentist stayed in strasbourg and the other um uh went to munich i think uh, another one went to uh to paris and yeah and i made other friends along the way so those are really from when i was four years old and um and then the people were from the next village and then it was strasbourg the bigger city and it was like a big um, a high school with like uh, 3,000 kids. So then like I, I made more connection, but maybe less uh, less deep. That's a big high school, 3,000 kids. At least that would be that would be big in the U.S. at least. Yeah, yeah, no, it was one of the biggest, yeah. I believe. You can get lost kind of in a school that big. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Like uh, you really, I liked it in a way because like uh, it, gave me a little bit more space also because in I was in a small village, like a thousand inhabitants. The next city was like 10,000 inhabitants. And then there was Strasbourg, 200,000 inhabitants. And so, so when you're in the same village, I remember we used to, to play around because there were always old ladies looking at the window, peeking at the, and, and the, we were waiting with a friend, <laughs> uh, my friend, the dentist, we would stay there waiting for the bus. And we saw like a lady move looking at us. And so then we just decided to fuck with, her, excuse me, bad word. Uh, we just like moved around. So she had to move in another room to see from another window. And then we saw oh, like the, the, the thing and she was just spying on us. It was just funny. Yeah, when you're bored in your village, you had you her nervous for some reason. <laughs> yeah, and I know. No, I, I think yeah, she wanted. Gotta she, be... she wanted to know what was happening in the village. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Oh my goodness! But your high school was larger than your village at the end. Yeah, of right. <laughs> it was. So it was. let me ask you a question because, um, obviously, I grew up. I grew up in New York. It was, you know, a big place, right? But on my street. Right on my street, um, at least at the times times when I grew up in the seventies as a kid, every single homeowner on that block, right, every neighbor was like your parent. At the end of the day, they were all watching you. If you did anything, they they would scold you. They were allowed to. I mean, my mom basically told any any adult, even when I was in elementary school, if he gets out of line, you can hit him, and I got hit like spanked by a couple of teachers. And if I came home and said, I got hit today, she's like, you probably deserved it. So I, I imagine it was very much the same in a small village yeah. where yeah, it like, sounds like everybody it. was watching out for everybody. Which is nice, which is nice. Yeah. I, I've lived in Paris and then like, you don't even know the neighbor next to you. And, and here, like if there is a sense of community and it's nice, even though sometimes it can be a little bit crowding, it is still like nice that people care. No, when you're a kid, it's annoying because you can't get away with anything because there's always somebody there with an eye on you, right? But as you get older, you realize how um, how nice that was. Yeah. Except for getting spanked. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you could skip that one. <laughs> Which you can't do today. <laughs> I, can't. I mean, that doesn't work today, but... Um, maybe that's why it doesn't work today, man. Cause all the spankings we got in the seventies. <laughs> yeah. Then we decided, eh, let's be done with that. Okay. I'm going to ask you one of my favorite questions. I don't want you to think too hard. Clear your brain, clear your mind. Here we go. First memory, first memory that pops in your head on you working on a computer. Working wouldn't be the word that I would use, but it was that that would be at my 
friend the dentist and we would play on an i guess it was an amiga and the memories i have was like a bubble bubble mm, i don't remember it was dinos creating bubbles and uh, some kind of bomberman uh, guy who was like flying and putting bombs around uh yeah we had a lot of fun and then we played bomberman and stuff like uh yeah i played a lot to to his place and then to my other friends they also had a uh, um consoles and computers so yeah so that was around whoa maybe i was seven eight something like that he had the computer from his uh big uh, brother the big brother was like nearly 10 years older than him so he had this and it was the old one so it just gave him away and then we had our fun on it so that must have been around like 1990. So that makes sense, right? A lot of people kind of start off playing games, but when was it that you maybe did your first thing that wasn't a game, whether it was? Hmm. It was still game related. So uh, I got like, um, in high school, you had to have like a, an advanced uh, um, calculator and people were like showing the program they were writing. They're like, wait, what is that? And I'm like, yeah, you can just like write some basic code on this TI-83. I was like, no way. And then like, how do you do that? So they told me, and then I put some go to everywhere and I had my, my first game, which was a, some kind of a casino game with randoms, like to, to, because it was easy kind to, to implement. So I played with that with menus and stuff. And uh, yeah, so that was my real first thing. I still have the, the thing. I could even export the program. I still have my first program on there. Nice. You have it, uh, you have it like printed out? No, it's, it it's still screen? in the, in the calculator, but because I don't have the cable, you know, it was like a jack. And so I haven't exported it yet. Oh, so that pro you, you loaded that game on your calculator. It wasn't even like on a PC. Or oh, actually I typed it on my calculator. That's how bored I was at high school. Oh my God. <laughs> Did you have computer classes? I mean, you would have been late 90s, so Yes, maybe around not. 90s, 19, uh, 97, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, they're they're obviously their personal computers at that point, but I guess you're you went to school in that little village, right? So you must have just they didn't have any sort of tech in there or anything like that. We actually had I I to get some memories we had a computer and we had like some kind of educational programs on them i think my memories are like some kind of a ladybug on the green background must be grass or something like that i don't remember what it was about anymore but uh but yeah i remember we had a f not a lot of time like maybe i've done like one or two hours in the whole my whole um uh elementary school and then in high, middle school nothing uh oh, except maybe in technology uh, we used a little bit to maybe create some word document or something like that and then high school nothing uh the people who wanted to be in the computer club could be and they were mostly playing quake 3 and doom <laughs> and uh and setting up the network and and that's but that was it like uh, and i didn't go to the computer cl uh, club that much I wasn't part of it because I didn't have a computer at home. So then I didn't feel like I, I, I could interact much except just play the game sometimes to time. So. So then what subjects were you sort of most interested in, in high school? Where, where were you spending time? Ooh, that's a, or none of it. Yeah, just, no, I was, just didn't like any, like of it. really, I was a good student up until I guess, uh, the first year of high school. And after that, I was so bored with the way uh we were educated which was basically like you need to learn this by heart and you need to spit it out during the the test and that's it and and then at some point it was like the third time that we've seen the second world war and stuff i mean it was important because our region was really in the middle of it so we my family got some trauma from it and stuff like that so so there was like it's a big subject, but at some point, how many times you can remember the date of the treaty of Versailles and stuff like that, that was not so interesting to me, even though now I'm an history geek and geek. And every time I go on Wikipedia, I just stay for hours. But at that time I was like, no, I'm, I'm done. Like, I'm, yeah, I was not interested 
that much. In math, I was doing badly because I was not like quick to grasp some concept. Physics, I was good. Physics, I was good. And biology, I liked it. I was pretty good, decent as well. But all the rest like kind of bored me. I didn't like to write. I have a, not a great uh, handwriting uh, as well. So I think all of this made me not really enjoy my high school for the, um, uh, let's say, for the educational part. And English, English I liked. Um, but that was about it. And what were your parents? Were your parents um, on top of you because you weren't necessarily doing well or they just sort of were they laid back and just like i think at that time that's tough yeah at that time they had other problems in their mind and they were kind of trusting me for being a good student for my past <laughs> my past bought me like a non-bothering uh parents but yeah like i was kind of crashing down i nearly thought about even like redoing the last year because basically I put my at the end of uh, the last year you decide which school you want to continue to and I put all my my wish my wishes and I was accepted nowhere nearly <laughs> I was like yeah maybe I should uh, because That's what I was going to ask you yeah because normally they would uh, they, they they look for the last year how you did and on the last test as well but the last year in general is more important than the rest and my last year was really awful. It was my worst of the worst. So, so then uh, a friend of mine, which is one of my best friends that I met in uh, high school, um, he was, dude, you need to take like the last one and put this school. And I was like, and in French, we have like a very um, detailed view on how you are a success or how you are a failure. And of course, being a failure is not great. So... If you don't do the very good high, uh, very good university and school, then you're a failure, and you can be a big failure or, or, or uh, less of a failure. And so there is a ranking of how a failure you can be. You know, I guess it's like, oh, are you a, are you uh, are you in Harvard or are you in uh, YC Penn or something like that, UC Penn and stuff like that? It's like there is some kind of ranking of how good you are. And in France, it's like, yeah, you either go to the engineering school, then there is. Um, good universities but there are a few and then there is also the computer school paying ones and then you have like technology um university which is more like hands-on um instead of just doing theory because engineering is a lot of theory and then there is like bts which is like you work for two years to learn a computer job which is mostly technical you put cables and stuff like that and then you're good to work but then you have a bad pay and also uh everybody will tell you that you're a failure. At least that's what they made me believe back then. <laughs> and that's what I did. I did the last... And is that the path you took? <laughs> exactly. Okay. And, and I was on a wait list. So they, they didn't want me directly. They were like, yeah, maybe if other people in the wait list don't want to come to our school, maybe we'll take you. So I was really nearly on oh the verge of not doing ID at all. IT at all. And uh, yeah. So what would have happened? What would have happened if they didn't let you in what would have been your next course of action would you have just retaken your last year in high school at that point so there was this option but then i got my final test so then it was like mm, too bad and, and i mean i could have passed again i could have tried again though um but also there was maybe to just do the university that is not very highly ranked and in general they accept everyone uh, so you just have to fill in the form, uh, formula and they, and they start later in the year. So you can come afterwards, basically. And they're like, okay, worst case scenario, I do that. Um, but I didn't because finally they accepted me. And, uh, and it was perfect because it was, I'm more of a hands-on hands -on person. And that's why also, I guess, I didn't match with the classic uh, French training because it's all about theory. And they don't tell you what, what, it, what it is for, you know, like... Um, sequence you know in mathematics for years it was like it was still like a mystery for me and and then the other day were well, like a, a few years ago like uh, thinking like oh but this is just a math sequence like this is just that but they didn't tell me that you can apply that in my in, uh, computers or something like that because even the teacher didn't know because the teacher are so disconnected from real life because they've been teachers they've been just in the educational system so they don't know what the world needs out of those skills and so basically you learn stuff you need to do abstract 
problem solving, but then you still don't know why it's what's the purpose of that is. It seems to me that this so correct me if I'm wrong here. It seems to me like what you ended up doing is going into a two year trade school. Right? Yeah, I and think it would be even in the US and even in the US a stupid stigma that the only kids that go to trade schools are the ones that are not smart enough to go to university. It's such a ridiculous thing. It's more like, and my two boys are kind of in this camp. They don't want to go to university. They're kind of done with school. And now one of them is um, electrician and is about to go into a trade school for that. And I'm super excited for him, right? Because that's much more in line with where sort of he is right now. So it's interesting how that happens, like just wild. So will your parents, where, so now that you're going to go to this school, right, this, say to your trade school, we'll call it, your parents are like what? They're supportive. They're, they have their own problems anyway, so they're disconnected. Yes. So basically, we lost the house, uh, the family house that my parents built, that my grandfather architected. He was an architect. My parents went shopping around. There were like old houses that were disconstructed because they were still damaged from the war or something like that. Or they just like, oh, no, we, we, want a, we want a new building. My parents were like, oh, we love this piece. Can we get like the, the architecture plan, uh, the blueprints? And the whatever you're deconstructing, we will get it off of your of your of your loan. And um, um, and so they did that. They built the house with friends, and it was the family house, and it was like very warm, welcoming, and stuff. And then it came to an end because my father had like a he wasn't employed for a few years. He faced depression, alcoholism, and stuff like that. I didn't know at that time uh, that was all of these problems because he was hiding that from us, keeping it away from us. But um, And so we had to move in a very smaller apartment, paying three times the price of the rent that we had. But now we had the money from the from the house, so we could pay for it. But like, yeah, it was ridiculous. And... Um, and then I was far from all my friends. I didn't have a car. Even by bike, it was like an hour by bike. By buses, it was an hour to see all my friends. And I got, I got my first online connection in this apartment. So basically, I disappeared from real life and went fully virtual to see my friends. And I started playing an MMORPG. Uh, for three years, I was very addicted. I was playing every day uh during my study and that was also it was like the funny part because i was not studying i was just being at school doing my uh trade thingy and uh and i was checking the forums to see what happened on the server of the game during my day so i was not really like doing my lessons and i still had like good grades so it was just like the easy you know it's like you, when you put the life in easy mode that was that. <laughs> and I was playing. Um, I did. A ca um, you can know how much uh, hours you play on the game at the end of the year. Uh, during the year, you see that it just increases, but then you don't map it to reality. At the end of the year, I was like, oh, all of this put together means I played three months in my life for this year. I played three months when you put all the minutes put next to each other. It was full three months playing this game. So you basically did that for the the couple of years that you were in this trade school. So living at home, doing your school, passing, but basically spending the majority of your time online at that point. Yes, with my best friend at that time, which were uh, people from the from middle school. So now that you when you graduate this this school, like what's the next step? Now you have to get a job, right? Yes, and this is where my friend uh, who told me, hey, go put this last wish, really. And, and he fought for it because I'm like, oh, no, whatever. I don't want to do this school because it's, la it's less good, well-viewed, so I don't want to be there. And it was like a, the name was like accounting, kind of. It was management, but it sounded like accounting in, in French. And I was like, well, why would I want to do that? And, uh, and then it was just great for me. Uh, and so at the end of this year, he was one year older. He was like, hey, 
now I'm in Paris, I'm doing this, um, how do you call that, uh, alterning. Uh, basically, you go two months school, two months in a job. And you do that for like two an years. internship. Yeah, like some you, kind, yeah. And you'll get paid. You get yeah. paid. <laughs> My friend is, is, is hilarious. He, was, he sold me the idea by saying like, dude, if you do it, you will only work, we, you only be at uh, the job for one year total because it's only two months, two months, two months, you know, like on out of the two years, it's only one year in, in, uh, in, uh, in the job, but it will be counted as two years for your retirement. I'm like, I'm not <laughs> even working yet. What are you telling me about retirement? <laughs> That's hilarious. This guy, this guy was, this guy was a planner. He is. Scheming. He st still is. Still is. <laughs> So I did. I followed him, and it was great. It was great. I was in Paris. It was in uh, in Paris at that time. So my company, and he found me the the company to work with uh, through uh, his network. So I worked locally in Strasbourg, and then I went uh, to Paris for the study. Uh, I was losing money every month because they paid me the minimum of the mi the legal minimum they could, and it was not enough to pay my Paris rent for the place. Um, but, uh, but I had like, uh, I, I met new people. It was really good. I, I, st I'm still in touch with them and, uh, it was really good, really, really good experience. But you would have to spend, you'd have to spend two months in Paris working and then go back home for two months at a time to go to school. So when you were back home, you were living with your parents. That made sense. But how do you find a flat for just two months at a time? So I actually, with my, with my very nice friend who always scheming, we tried to hack the system and say, hey, uh, nice uh, youth hostel owner, could we just like rent one place? Because we move, we alternate exactly the opposite way. So I could go for the two months there and when he leaves and the opposite. So then we would only have one rent to do. But um, but the, the, the owner didn't like this idea. <laughs> so finally, I had to rent one. But it was not just for two months. I, ju I just paid like even for the months where I was not in. So That would have worked out great, though. Like you could have just been sort of roommates and paid. It, did, it didn't happen. But um, it was a, and it was like a, basically it was a student. The, the city was very student oriented. There was a lot of university, like the best uh, uh, sales people school uh, I don't know how to say that like kind of Harvard in France and um, business school yes and so there were like uh, a lot of students in this city and so this building was just like a kind of a hotel there was like an entrance with a guardian there and stuff and you can just go and it was like just a little little small room but it was fine it was uh... so so you're like 20 years old when you're doing this and we had a swimming pool yeah. indoor swimming pool that was cool <laughs> that she never used let's be honest you never used it oh i did no i did i did i i used it so much that at some point i said like okay not every day because i'm too tired to do that every day so i went every two days during summer i was there every two days okay i have to imagine that it was exciting to be in paris especially on your own at that age and then the, for the two months you had to come back to go to school, it was just miserable. You didn't want to come back. <laughs> oh, no. Sc school school was in Paris. I mean, it was uh, Paris, suburban Paris, like one hour away from Paris. So I nearly never went into Paris. First, by lack of money for paying the ticket, because I, just, I was just walking to school for 10 minutes. It was perfect for this. And, um, and then home, I would work. This is where my, my, uh, my work was. It was the other way around. Still, I mean, it's got to be a bummer after you have to leave that sort of independence. Ah, well, the, the truth is my mom at that time was also doing some studies in Paris. Um, was she? Uh, maybe. I, um, she was studying uh, uh, landscaping in the Jardin of Versailles. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And so, so we had some kind of an apartment because at that time as well, uh, my father and my mom split because it was too much the house, the alcoholism, the stuff. So, so it was kind of the basically the whole family 
Unity kind of just like disappear, popped up. So yeah, it's um, so I guess I focused on other things to not be a little bit depressed about it. And so when I came back, I stayed with my father, but at some point he was not doing anything and I had to do a lot of things at home. So then I said like, you know, I, I just don't want to do that. So I went to my to my mom who had a small apartment and she was not always there. Oh, so it was, so it was uh, good. It was nice. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, so it was actually pretty good. No, no, it was really good. And then I discovered work and uh, um, new uh, colleagues. And the uh, the friend I'm working with right now is one of the colleagues from 20 years ago that I met in that uh, first company. At some point, though, you finish your schooling. So it's not this sort of back and forth, like every two months, right? Is that the company you end up working for full time once your schooling is completely done? No, no, they, they did it me, they did me dirty. <laughs> so they wanted, they, they wanted to hire me actually. But then at that time, uh, the European law kind of changed how uh, education would work uh, in Europe. And basically you either had <clears throat> high school plus three years diploma, which I guess is um, license. I don't know if it's the name of uh, uh, in, in English. Then there was master, um, end of high school plus five years. And then you have doctorates. Okay. And so my diploma would be between plus three and plus five. I would be a plus four. So in France, they use a lot of salary grid and like, oh, no, you are a back plus four. So... You can be only considered as a back plus three, so you're downgraded to that. So your max salary in our company is that. Like, <clears throat> no, I'm not getting that. And I was still good at, at school. So like, no, I'm I'm aiming for a master. So I told them, like, yeah, I'm not gonna I, I don't wanna work for you right now because I just wanna finish uh studies. I wanna do a master. And so when I did my presentation, uh, my memoir uh for the school, the person from the company said, like, yeah. You know, uh, Tongi was fine, but I think we just don't want to hire him and stuff like that. To the teacher that was like making me pass, like just like basically telling me I was I was bad, and uh, and so and I did like a, I was happy with the presentation. I did it was pretty good, and the teacher looked at me, look at him, like kind of give me a wink, like I know what's happening right there. Don't you worry. It's not, I will take that into account. I think he's just trying to do you dirty. And this company kind of did dirty to um, many of people. But, uh, but anyway, so I didn't try to get back to them later on. Weird. Uh, <laughs> and so I did my master in virtual reality because like this uh, alternating school, um, I don't remember, to, you said it. Um, we had specialty and there was like, there was not cloud at that time, but there was like a mobile develop development. There was like more architecture, people who wanted like project manager and there was virtual reality. So I went there, we did virtual reality. We went to Finland to do some motion capture with like some kind of robot to make like a 3D animated movie and stuff like that. So it was fun. It was the best, <laughs> the best specialization to do. And then uh, they were in partnership with um, university in France that was specialized in re virtual reality. And so I went there in, uh, in Laval, like more in Bretagne, uh, closer to Bretagne. And so I did that. I did that for a year with six months school and then six months in a company. A different company at that point. And what year is this? Are we talking like... Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't go back to no, them. No, no. But this is like 2004, 2005 when you're, when you're doing this yes. year? Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It was uh, 2006. Uh, yeah, 2006. Uh, okay, so talk about this 2006 job when you're doing your master's in uh, virtual reality. Like, what was the job that you had? Was it connected to that? Oh, yeah, the, it was the whole point. Actually, I wanted to go to Japan. They had like a university and job in their laboratory that was crazy. But my girlfriend at that time was like, oh, no, I don't want you to leave. So I was like, okay, I'm going to stay she around Paris. She loved you, man. She and loved you. She, she didn't me. want you to but leave. But whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we didn't see each other for six years. I lived in a garage. 
like like really literally a garage above a garage for six months where nobody was there. I had zero internet connection. I would download PDF about C++ lessons so uh, at, at work so I could read them uh, on my computer at, uh, at in my three. Okay, wait, wait. Time out, time out, time out, time out. You jumped something here. You take, you, you, you have to do the six months with this company doing virtual reality. I'm assuming that your girlfriend at the time lived in the same place as you, right? Where you were going to school? No, no, uh, no, because the school was in another region and we went back to Paris and she lived with her mother and I lived at uh, the mother of her friend who had a small studio above her garage, lost in the middle of a little village. And you never saw her because it was a long distance relationship. Yeah, it became a long distance relationship. We were in co -loc um, co -co -locking, co location. Um, we, we lived together in the small village far away uh, because her mom lived far away. She couldn't check. But when we were in Paris, her mom could check because her mom couldn't know that we were together after two years. Well, oh, except you had the friend's place you were staying. Man, it's just complicated, dude. <laughs> it is. It is. So lo looking back on that right now, knowing what you know now, obviously, but if you go back in time and she's telling you don't go to Tokyo, you're going to Tokyo now, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because she, we, we moved in together. And after we moved in together, I packed all her stuff to the new apartment. And one week after, she's like, I think I don't love you anymore. I'm like, okay, well, we haven't seen it for six months. So let's try to figure it out and be a couple to, you know, to be grown ups. And then she was leaving every night. So like, anyway, <laughs> and then she dumped me anyway. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> so what was some of the work you were doing? So I worked on a visualization system for sending rocket into space uh, from the European Spatial Agency, not directly, but for um, a little company that were doing their 3D animation and stuff like that. And so we had like a real time, like uh, uh, game engine, basically, uh, that we we use some open source base, which was an open scene graph. And we basically made sure that when the camera cannot see the, the Ariane rocket launch into the sky because it's too far away, then we switch the screen into 3D simulation based on the coordinates we had. And so the clients of Ariane, who would like send satellite into space, could see at which step are we, uh, are we and where are we sending the sim a simulation of the sending of the, of the satellite. So we got like the trigger event, like when they open the, the top of the rocket. So we create the animation of the opening of the rocket and then send the, the two satellites. You got the telemetry in. back, basically. And so you, how do you, how do you, um, how do you test a system like that? I mean, how do you test a system like that where? I, I was like, not good enough to answer this question. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I was just like the intern, you know. So I mostly did like some integration uh, of the models and stuff like that. I worked a little bit on the code base, and uh, but mostly it was the my master, my my uh, intern uh, uh, manager basically, who would like uh, do the heavy lifting uh, work. And uh, and I was starting in 3D in C++. I was really starting in C++ in 3D. I mean, there, there was like so much to learn. Oh, yeah. It, it came to me nearly the first day with a book big like that. And like, here, there is a bookmark. You go there and you learn about matrix operation, matrices operation. And it was like the book, like it was like a, the, a math applied to gra 3D graphics. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, no. What did I get myself into here? What year do you... You finish your master's. You finish your master's in that 2007, 2006. Six, six, yeah. 2006. And then you got your master's degree in computer science with a specialization in virtual reality. Did this company hire you after that or it was time to move on again? No, my intuition was like, I don't know if I want to work there because like the guy paid me like the minimum of the minimum. 
<laughs> and um, yeah, I didn't feel it. Um, so, and I think they didn't have any spot left actually. So, so it just like the market in virtual reality in 2006 was very little. So either you would find some job in a very few of the startups that would innovate in virtual reality, or you would go in video games. Only one friend actually did that. And now he works like for Warner Bros. Uh, Warner Bros. Um, video games uh, in Montreal, but he did Ubisoft, like he did nearly all of the uh, Assassin's Creed. But he's the only one, and he he, he he had like a hard time starting, and I didn't want to have a hard time. I already had a hard time, like with all those few years getting dumped in the last minute. As so I was like, no, I need something for me, and I think money would solve that little problem that I have right now. So, so I decided to just go for a job to make some money, and I didn't really care about virtual reality at that time. So your plan was to just throw your resume at anything that looked interesting, but in Paris. Stay in Paris, or you didn't care? No, I was no. I wanted to stay in Paris because this was where the opportunity would be better in France. So I just like decided, yeah, I'm gonna stay in Paris, and if I earn enough money, I would get my own place, and there will be a lot of opportunities in Paris. So I'm just gonna stay here. I liked the, and I, I didn't like, I didn't know the city much at that time, but um, but I started to discover the dance scene uh, there. And then I got hooked and I was like, yeah, I want to stay there. Like, it's so fun. So, so I decided like making money and uh, having fun. So yes. How did you, okay. I want to talk about the job, but you're saying that's the time when you just kind of now finishing up university to go work full time as you discover sort of the dance scene. Just give me a couple minutes on um, how you discover dance and that you love dance and, was there a, another person involved? Was it like, like, just give me a little story. Cause now we're talking. My ex, <laughs> my ex. So, so I introduced her to role-playing games on classic pen and paper. Um, and, um, and then she was like, oh, it's fun, but can we make it more fun? And she looked for it and then she discovered there was live action and role-playing games and where you dress up and basically it's like, improvisation theater with game mechanics and so we discover like uh, people who were playing in actual uh, uh, mushroom cave around paris and because we were playing dark elves who lives underground so we would keep totally like uh, put ourselves in dark elves mode in growths in in uh, in caves with like uh torches and stuff like that it was like really you were somewhere else basically you really lived in a new experience and they went to a party in paris and it was a medieval um uh, party with music live music and everybody was dressed up so at some point i walked in to go towards the bar i was all alone my friends were at the table so i just saw myself i couldn't re um recognize myself with the clothes because it was clothes for dressing up like it was costumes, medieval costumes. I walked in a place I didn't know with music that didn't seem like usual. I was like, where am I? I, I traveled in time and space at the same time. I was like, wow, this is wild. And then like, I liked the music and uh, people were like dancing and it was very friendly. Like, oh, we need, we need somebody here. Can you dance? I'm like, yeah, I don't know how to dance. Like, ah, come on. And then I would Two, two, two or three people grabbing you to put you in a circle and then you dance with it all together and then you're like okay cool and and that's how i got like hooked with dance i was like oh this is a nice sensation like people are friendly there's music you dance really nice were you hesitant at first to go like this is going to be stupid but she wants to go so i'm going to do it or were you sort of excited from the beginning no i'm i'm kind of very open minded in general and so new experience, maybe I, ha I, I will hate it and will never do that again, but until I do it, I can't know. So I need to try it to see if I like it or not. Do they still do that stuff in Paris? Is that, does that community still exist? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's still every week. Uh, Cap Saint Sabin, I'm pretty sure they still do it. I haven't gone there for, for a long while because I don't go to Paris much. 
and uh and also i don't if i go to paris i don't bring all my costumes and my boots and my all my my everything so so yeah but uh, but i'm pretty sure and there and then there is like a lot of uh, renaissance fair all around in france and so the group i used to dance with the musical group they still play around france uh, and and they are regular at this place i still believe yeah that's wild man so so tell me now what this next job ends up being how long does it take you to find your next gig okay so uh <laughs> i don't know what my intern managers thought of me at that time but since i got like dumped i got heartbroken broke, it was like crying on the job it was like I, I was just a mess and um and then i they they closed the the company for three weeks for the holidays during the summer so i had to go back to my mom anyway so I went there and then I was just like, no, nah, I'm not taking this. Like I need to, like, nobody will want like a little cry baby who doesn't feel good about himself, like for a job. Like I need like to, to grow up on this and just be, be done with it. So like in those three weeks, I just went over this uh, relationship and I as well, uh, I used Monster. I don't know if it was a platform internationally, but in France it was big. It was Monster. So I used Monster, put my resume after coming back from a party at three in the morning <laughs> with friends. And so like I finished like at five in the morning, something like that, woke up at 11 and I had like three unread emails and three phone call, uh, missed phone call. They're like, oh, cool. <laughs> so then really? I just... that fast? Yeah. Like... In six hours, I got that. So I'm like, all right, okay. So I'm calling back everybody. But you were drunk, so you were like, "What would? What did I put on my resume? What did <laughs> I make myself look like?" You must have scrambled to see. Let me just double check what I said. <laughs> yeah, no, actually, I I was not drunk because I'm I, I don't drink, so I'm actually never drunk. I I never I don't even know what I am when I'm drunk. I it makes me a little bit afraid. Because I'm already quite unhinged, so I don't know what I do if I if I were drunk. Have you never had a drink all the nights that we went out talking late with Rona? I'm pretty sure I was drink? drinking pineapple juice or something like that. Uh, not even wine. No, I try to like it. Super interesting. I try to like it because like wine. you know, like it, this glass would be very nice with the whiskey in it and stuff like that. But but no, I'm drinking water. That's super interesting. Yeah, no, it's cool. I mean, it's cool. You know, I, I, I don't know. I, I like my little glass of whiskey, um, when we go out. I know, but I, I, I'm pretty good. Like, I'll just have my two glasses and then I'm done. Like, it's all, it's all good. Uh, but I just don't remember you not having. That's interesting, man. Super cool. Okay, so you were drunk, so you knew exactly what you sent, <laughs> and then you had these messages. So. Uh, so yeah, so go on, go on, go on. So what do you do next? In the afternoon, same, like three phone calls, three emails unread. So I just basically went back to everybody who contacted me and booked myself to the brim on when I would go back to Paris. So when I went back to Paris, I would work and then go to two interviews per night. And uh, so I did all the, because in France, basically it's hard to fire people. So we have a lot of engineering companies that hire people and then send them to their clients. So the clients, when they board with you, they can just interrupt the contract with the company and, uh, and that's it. Okay. So uh, there is a lot of them. And so basically I just interviewed a lot of them. And at the end of that, like I had like um, 10 10 or 14, 14 interviews. And then I got like uh, three offers. One was not even signed by them. So basically I could sign, go back to them like, oh, finally we found somebody, bye. And the offer was not even nice. And and I really didn't like the, the interview. I like, oh my God, it's really if I don't have a choice. Uh, then I had another one, which was like uh, not so bad, but I learned that the financial director left with four millions out of the bank. And she was like, Look, looked for by, by I think the, the police or something like that. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Maybe not. <laughs> and the last one was actually nice. And I could even have worked on 3D. It was like for helicopter simulator. And in 3D, I was like, oh, that sounds cool. But they didn't get like the, the, the contract with the, the client. So finally, I just 
got hired with them finally, but uh, but I stayed with them and worked on other projects. And I stayed with them for six years because they were good. Six years is a long time. I mean, you're there now till 2012, 13. But what were some of the, what was the coolest project you got to work on in, the, in those six years? Oh my God. Oh, they were pretty cool. Uh, I worked on the Airbus A350. And doing so we what? based doing, um, they were creating a uh, operating system, real time operating system that would handle, like, for example, if you open uh, the, um, the gauge for the gas, um, then the, the actual computer there will decide if it opens or not. And so they actually have for safety, three computers at each of those critical paths. And there is two from the same vendor and one from another one. So in case there is a flipping bit because of a solar wind or whatever, the other one, since it doesn't have the same architecture, the uh, physical architecture, the hardware uh, architecture, might not have this bl uh, bit flip. And so it'd be like, wait, it didn't tell me like to open the gate. It told me like to go nose down or whatever. Like, so, so basically they, they do control themselves. So it makes you think a little bit about like blockchain, you know, like with the, 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 the signer that just verify if like it makes sense. It's, it was that uh, without all the cryptography. And they actually used also different cables and different protocol of communication. There was a CAN, there was R-Ink and stuff like that. So basically, even if the protocol has a problem in, in a flaw in the design, since another cable with another protocol was also sending the message, normally in the end, they should still say the same thing. And if they don't say the same thing, then we just don't do anything instead. But you needed like consensus from all three computers or something? Yes. Yeah, I guess exactly. it's nice to have the redundancy. Yes, but that cost a lot of weight. It's the biggest uh, weight in the in the um, plane. It's the cables because it's everything redundant everywhere to make sure what if there is something that cuts a cable, a mouse, whatever. Like we need to make sure the information passes otherwise the plane can just crash. Wow. So you were building those systems essentially for the airlines. Yes. Yes. It was like a real plane for airlines. Yeah. Because like if you work in military, there is less need for this because when you're a military person, you sign a contract, like, yeah, if I die, I die and that's it. But when you buy your ticket at the airplane, <laughs> it's like, oh, if I die, I die. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, actually safety in uh, planes is more important uh, than in uh, rockets. Because rockets, the people that are sent uh, in space, they are considered military. So basically, if I die, I die. That's too bad, but that's it. But in, um, in uh, civil aviation, like they need to be very serious about it. And so I worked on the operating system, basically making sure that they called it partition. A partition it was an app partition. And basically, basically, it was containers. It's like, uh, yeah, the memory of this app shouldn't write on the memory of another app, even if it's tangent like if you have a buffer overflow we block it because we shouldn't like write in the gps coordinates of the autopilot while you just trying to open the ga the gate or something like that man that's some low real low level sort of stuff you were working on which is i'm imagining again all c c++ yes but i didn't code it i designed it in um in actually an a scripting language from the uml uh from uml it's called ocl uh, object uh, constraint language, I think. So basically before, what they used to do for the A380, um, they had like mathematical proof formula to prove, yes, the part of the app from this would never access this memory from the thing. But basically you needed like mathematician to read it and to, to, to think about it and analyze. And here we could just run a script that would test that actually the program was not like uh, reading memory from another partition. Then we could actually use the code from OCL to to make sure like uh, to to run a bench test on the on the actual CPU and OS that was running. So this OCL was basically generating the code. Uh, be, uh, more be run to uh, test. Uh, to test uh, the thing. I actually, I wrote it. I didn't went back because then I left the project. So I didn't went to the testing phase of the thing because they were creating the hardware as well at the same time. And we had like some kind of um, centrifugating 
machine where they put the CPU in them and they were like turning them and throw sand at it, like to, like a sand tempest in the middle of it and see like, does does it blend, <laughs> you know, does it survive the, the extreme conditions? So with temperature and stuff like that. So, so yeah, I didn't go to the actual testing phase of those uh, scripts. Uh, it was not unit tested at that time. It was not like we just tested like that, but yeah. So then it's like 2012 at this point. What makes you leave? What makes you leave this company? Something new and exciting shows up at your desk. <laughs> oh, I got a forty. So basically, they they froze my salary at level at at the first year, and then it's like, oh, it's a crisis. It was a 2008, so it was a crisis for four years. Um, <laughs> so uh, my my salary got frozen. And um, and then like I met somebody and told me, hey, come there, like the salary are better. And like, yeah, okay. And the truth is, I also discovered Bitcoin a few years before, and I loved it. I loved the idea behind it, and I was a little bit kind of anti-banking system and stuff. So so like, but then I was like, but I actually don't know banking. It's just like my pre predetermined ideas, but I actually don't know from inside. And this uh, guy was promising me more salary actually was working. It was working in banking. I'm like, hmm, maybe I should check it out and see the beast from the inside and see how bad it is or is it maybe decent? So I worked in finance, corporate finance uh, for two years uh, and discovered the real world of finance. What kind of projects were you working on there then? Uh, so it was like a, a a full app with a UI for the traders to pass their trades or at least create their trades and then make them verify by the platform. Basically, it was like, if I create this trade with this client for this amount of money and there is a crash of 2008, will the bank still live <laughs> at the end? We will still have money at the end or will it make it crash? And so basically we were running a lot of simulation with a Monte Carlo algorithm and stuff like that. We had like a many clusters uh, that would do that. And the idea was uh, to, to run uh, those. And so I worked on swap. We had a new European swap uh, rate that could uh, happen between banks uh, for interbanking in Europe. So I did that for the just address the UI. But then uh, the project manager liked what I was doing and I was always geeky and always like, oh, did you see this? I was discovering Docker at that time also a little bit. And so we're like, hey, uh, do you want to work on a super secret project? And I'm like, yeah. And so the super secret project was to basically use all the compute of all the company. And instead of just having clusters that were costing a lot of money, use all the, the compute from every computer and use them and basically distribute all the computation that was needed for either intraday trading or for a risk uh, calculation and distribute it automatically again, uh, among all the, the, the machine. And, um, and it was great. I worked like with the, I think the person who motivated me to start a new language because I was really C++, C++ only at that time. And you were like, yeah, but you're losing too much time handling memory and stuff like that. You should, if you want to make like a big project, aim for another language, a higher level language. And this is when I decided to look for something and I went into Go. But, uh, but yeah, and so I worked with him. Like we were just two of us working on this project to, to do that. And we were like in competition with a external company that was doing the same, but there were like 20 of them. And basically we were advancing as fast as them and we had like better performance most of the time. Uh, but we didn't have internal support because if we failed internally, then the director would be sh uh, pointed uh, finger at. So you're like, no, I'm not taking this risk. I I'd rather point the finger at uh, some external company. And so, yeah. So finally the project didn't work, but I left before because I had an opportunity to go in Strasbourg back and my uh, wife, because we, we just got married, um, didn't really like Paris at all. And so, and she liked my region. And so we decided to, to go back to Strasbourg. I was happy to go back as well. So. Right. C couple things there. Couple things. One, uh, TLDR were your 
ideas on banking sort of true or false? Like, give me the TLDR and what you sort of learned. Okay, so that friend of mine who told me about like maybe change language and stuff, um, he also uh, taught me a lot about uh, finance. He was very passionate about it. And so he showed me the, the good side of banking and how it really actually holds part of the world together and the economy and stuff like that. So it has a very important role that maybe cryptocurrencies couldn't do uh, because it's some kind of regulated, the, the inflation and stuff like that, which help sometimes, you know. And but the problem that I saw is that it's still driven by people who might have ego and that just are completely disconnected from the impact they can have on the rest of the world. And that makes me like sad because like they have a very important role and they kind of toy with it. You met your wife, I'm assuming they're in Paris, but what was she doing at the time in Paris that you met her? She was a flight attendant for Delta Airlines. Oh, you met her on a flight? What? Can I give me the story, dude? <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> no, so I was I was dancing. So I got into, I, I, I did a lot of dances and I discovered the Foho dance, which is a Brazilian dance in Paris. And then I discovered the whole Foho community in Paris. And I started dancing like between three or six times a week. It was like crazy. <laughs> and um, I organized uh, things outside. And I was at my usual place on the Thursday and she was there. And it was her last uh, layover in, um, in Paris because she didn't like the city and she wanted to stop being a flight attendant as well. So she was looking, uh, she was uh, spending time with her friend uh, one last time in Paris and then she would finish her work with going to Brazil and South America and see her friend from there and then just stop being a flight attendant. And she met me and then she had to come back to Paris a little bit more than she wished she had. <laughs> She was from Brazil. She was Brazilian. No, Miami, born and raised. Miami. Nice. Man. Yes. <laughs> okay. You know, you know, I love Miami, so that's all good. I so think Fort Lauderdale, met... actually, maybe. I don't remember if it was that's fa Fort Lauderdale. It's fair to say Miami. I mean, it's Fort Lauderdale. So that's kind of cool. So you met that night, and then you started talking, and then she came back to Paris. And then the decision was that you were going to get – you must have been going to South Florida too then. Yes, I visited Florida the first time, like uh, the 1st of January, it was my birthday. And um, and yeah, it was, she was like, hey, uh, I don't remember how it worked, but like, hey, maybe I could just come. I had enough money to, just, and it, it was cheap. It was 500 for the ticket back and forth, I think. So I went there. I had the, we celebrated the New Year's Eve in the middle of the plane because it was New Year's Eve in Hawaii or something like that. <laughs> and so everybody was like having fun. The, the, the flight attendant like had party hats and stuff like that. And so I arrived in Miami. So yeah, I discovered Miami uh, that way. Yeah. But then the decision eventually was to, um, for her to move to France and go back to your, to that, to your town, essentially. Yes, uh, but actually she she wanted to start studies. That's why she wanted to stop uh, being a flight attendant. Her idea was to start studying again. And she went to Monterey, uh, studies of language. I don't remember. Um, it's a kind of a quite known uh, school, I think, in, the, uh, in English teaching. I don't remember the name exactly, but it was Monterey. So she went in California. So then we had even a bigger time span to work. So, so basically when I went back from my parties at three in the morning, I would just call her and see how she was doing. <laughs> and, uh, that's how we kept in touch like, uh, for, for a while. And she moved in Paris finally later because it was very expensive, those studies. And a friend of hers was like, why don't you come in France? The study won't be as expensive and then you can see your boyfriend. So do you like him enough? And I was like, yeah, I think so. So then she just came in Paris and did another master's in, um, in intercultural in uh, Paris. So the decisions to move back home, but at that point, what year is it again? It's 2014 or something like that. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, remote culture isn't really happening still just yet. So I guess, but 
there's enough tech in that town for you to find another job. In Strasbourg, no, especially, especially not in Go, because I decided at that time to specialize in Go. Uh, not immediately. First, I tried to do like to help local businesses with um, automation, make like everything possible so they don't have so much paperwork to deal with and lose time doing those or and, and maybe problems having uh, with paperwork. But it didn't quite work. It also transformed me more in a salesperson for solutions, existing ERPs and stuff like that. And yeah, I wasn't having that much fun and not much business as well. So it was a no-go and no-go. And so uh, my wife was like, hey, uh, what do you want to do actually? Because I try to adapt to the local market and I was like, what I want to do is code in Go. I love the language. I, and yeah, that would be great. It's like, well, just do it. Yeah, but I don't have like real professional experience with that. Like, yeah, but when did you have professional experience in any of the languages you've done in the past when you started a mission for those companies? And it was true. I, I did like Java, I did C Sharp, I did like every time it was a new language, a new domain, like OCL, I discovered. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> OCL language. I, w I, I had a book about UML. I bought it back in the day. And I had this interview with uh, this uh, Airbus, you know, a uh, company. It was like a, a vendor for Airbus. And it was like, um, so uh, I passed the interview. And he was like, yeah, you clearly know your stuff. You, you clearly didn't, like, read about this the scripting language, like, last night. <laughs> and I was like, no, it was... At noon, <clears throat> while I was eating my sandwich. <laughs> You're right. It was at noon. <laughs> That's funny. That's yeah. hilarious. And this is where I did like my first um, uh, code reviews. And it was really good. It was good about quality. So it was nice working with him. Okay. But you got to get a job. And it's not, not where you're living. So what's the decision now you make? LinkedIn. My wife is pretty good. Uh, about like finding your values out of what you like and um, and interviewing you until she really gets what are the values behind that. Like, why do you like to code, for example? Oh, like, is it because like you have control over the thing? Is it because you like the creativity? You like, I don't know. So, and she finds that. And so basically she helped me create the profile, the LinkedIn profile that I still have today. And so since I didn't have that much problem finding a job without actually looking for it, it was just people coming to me like, hey, we need people in Go. Are you available? Yeah, sure. And uh, and back in 2014, I mean, I actually had my first client in 2015. I had like one year. And also I was getting uh, a kid, so it was a little bit like a uh, special. But yeah, I I started working with a remote company because basically go people in Europe, at least in France, there was not so many. So, so basically they were okay with remote because they didn't have that much choice actually. Nice. So you finally get a job where you get to code and go every day. And it was remote. You have to really learn how to do that because the tooling even for that is still pretty, pretty weak. Right. So a lot of some instant messenger and, a lot of phone calls, I guess. I mean, how did that work in 2015? So I joined the company and it was, uh, they wanted like, they had already an MVP in Python and they wanted to make sure they would scale if they needed to scale. So they wanted to move all the way into microservices and stuff like that. Um, so the responsible for the tech was not like fully uh inside the company because he had a job on the side so it was more like a tech advisor we'll say so he already had the idea of which library to use in go it was a go micro uh, for the microservices and stuff like that so i discovered like a lot of stuff <laughs> in microservices distributing uh, computing rpcs and stuff so it was really really a lot of learning uh very interesting and um and he also pointed me at the go for slack and this is uh, why I started uh, joining the Gopher Slack. And this is also I started learning about um, uh, Go Bridge, Golang Bridge. Uh, yeah, Go Bridge. Yes. So so yeah, and this is how I started to actually get more involved in the community and 
start knowing the people of the community and the speakers. So then I went to the conference in France, which was called Dot Go. Like uh, I started being more into the community because I was really enjoying it. I I'm really like I guess community oriented in general. That's why I love also the Foho dance because the community of Foho is always so nice. So yesterday I did the event. There was a girl I never met her. Say hey, oh she's from Indenburg. Oh do you know um, Richard? Yeah, of course. And 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 just like people know each other, like and and they're in Edinburgh. Like like it's just like the the network of the those community. And since they are so welcoming, like you want to network, you want to know the people. And and the go for uh, the go community, I always loved it as well. It was just welcoming, uh, nice, and yeah, I, I always felt like nice with uh, with the gophers. So, so how long were you with that company, working on that project? Uh, so I worked on the V1, uh, I guess for one, a little less than a year, something like that. And then if I remember right, this, my friend from who I'm working with right now was like, Hey, Hey, I have a blockchain project, uh, with solar panels and redistribution of energy through blockchain. I was like, wow, sounds cool. <laughs> Count me in. So, so then I worked with him. And and then I just went on to other mission, and it was nearly always perfect. It always finished before I had to to start a new one. So so that was really really nice. Right, but now you're talking almost like over the last seven years, you've been just working on a lot of sort of one year projects, um, in some in blockchain. What other sort of industries over the last say seven years? The next one was IoT. Um, so it was an IoT uh, monitoring and management platform, uh, which was based on LoRa, uh, if you know about it. Uh, anyway, yeah, it, yeah, okay. And um, and then there is, uh, then I did, uh, what did I do? Then I worked in banking as a service. Then I worked, uh, so it was more in the payment part for the card payment uh, with debit and credit cards. I've worked in, oh God, I'm, oh, um, I'm drawing a blank. Oh, I worked in blockchain again in Consensus, which uh, uh, in GoCorum, which is a fork of Ethereum uh, to, to, to do handle a consortium blockchain, which means like every actor knows each other. It's not like a trustless, it's trustful in that sense. Um, I worked on the wallet there and then I discovered uh, dagger. I was wondering, uh, because basically Docker changed my life as already for my own server that I administrate myself. And also it's Docker who pushed me to choose go over Ruby or Python. Uh, for a higher level language, uh, like wow, we can do cool stuff with Go. So like, yeah, maybe. And um, and so I was like uh, following Solomon Hikes on uh, Twitter, and I was like, what is he doing now? Because I knew he he left Docker like a few years ago, and then he's like, hey, check this out. We're doing a new thing in CI, so have a look. And I joined the Discord, and it was they were like doing some. I don't remember how they say that, but basically on Calendly, you could just like book a time with the founders and say like, hey, what are you doing? And so I did that and like, hey, what are you doing? And I just like uh, got a great talk and then I came back, we had more talk and then like, you know what? I have some cryptocurrencies in my company and maybe I could diversify my portfolio and invest in your company. And uh, like, well, that will be a little bit harder because, you know, like it's uh, it's not like when you just buy a token and that's it. It's like it's like paperwork, lawyers and stuff like that. They say, but maybe you could work with us I'm like, hmm, yeah, maybe. And so that's when I joined Dagger. And I what year was there that for uh, 2022. Wow. He got to I guess he got to finally talk to Solomon. Yes. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yes. That's cool. And, and and we went to San dude. Francisco I have a funny Solomon. I have a funny Solomon story. So I had friends that worked at Docker in San Francisco, and I was in town, and they invited me to go over to the office to work for a few hours because I was in between something. And I'm walking, I'm walking. I walked through the door, and it, there was a long hallway, at least in this office at the time. And as I'm walking, there's a guy walking, um, 
by me, you know, and after he walks by me, I stop and I go, you look familiar. And he said, yeah, I'm Solomon. I said, oh, that's why you look familiar. <laughs> and then we both <laughs> laughed and I said, hey, thanks. I'm, I'm hanging out for the day. He's like, enjoy. And then we went on our own separate ways. <laughs> but it's funny, right? I just like stop. Hey, you look familiar. <laughs> and he I laughed, just see man, you or something. He laughed. So it was so funny, bro. Even like now when I think about it, I just think it's funny. <laughs> yeah. But he was cool. Like that didn't like you could tell it didn't bother. If anything, he enjoyed it. He enjoyed that moment, you know. Uh, how long did you work at Dagger then for a couple? So you got there in 22. So, And so I worked there for a year and I guess like a year and a half. What aspects of that did you work on? Because I feel like that was, and tell me if I'm wrong, I feel like the work there would have been the least technical work you'd ever done. No, there was, no, it was uh, a lot to absorb. So I'm, I, I can absorb but I'm not very fast to grasp. So it was a, a big, because there was like, I know containers, I know how to use Docker, but I didn't know the internals of containers. I know there were like some syscall for getting like a, the namespacing in Linux and stuff like that. But then we are using in Dagger BuildKit, which is a project out of uh, Docker as well. And it's basically a runner of containers. And um, there is a whole API. And the problem that you have when you work in containers, and especially when you kind of start them and, and when you are in the core uh, part of the library, you're like, at what level am I? Am I in the program that run the dagger? Am I before like asking the dagger daemon, please send my thing? Am I in a dagger daemon? Am I in the shim, which is just a program that actually runs into the container? But if I'm in the shim, am I in the container? And do I send a new action to a new container? Then you, you just like, at which level of the place am I and which data I have access to at this time? And it's very confusing at some point because also at some point, it's just like a, a process running another and you're not in the code anymore. And then you need like, there is some serialization marshalling to do. So it's very confusing. Yeah, I, I I never understood I never understood the novel the the novel thing Dagger was trying to do. Cause GitHub already has it, Circle CI already has this. I I didn't understand what was novel. Why use Dagger over GitHub Actions or Circle CI or what was novel here? You use Dagger in GitHub Action or Circle CI. So the thing you can run it locally. They're not the first one to to do it, but like uh, there were others that do it, but they didn't work quite well. Sometimes it didn't work anymore. Uh, so you can totally run your pipeline locally. It will run exactly the same because it's fully like containerized on this sense. And the added value is basically instead of YAMLizing your life away of different action and stuff like that, while well, you code it. You coded in different languages. So there was like first the Go SDK, Python, TypeScript. Now community added way more. And the idea is instead of having some half imperative in a YAML and it's not very testable and you just have to get pushed to see if I'd actually made an, a, a mistake in my YAML, like, you know, like just a git oh, commit yeah, no, CI. I've been, I've been there oh, like right? 20 commits. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so you know yeah. the problem. And you need to wait because like, even if you're optimized, you can still wait just for the, the git of action to actually take, uh, to works. So then you w wait for the VM or the, the thing that runs it. And then when it's good, then it runs your code. And if it's not optimized, you have to wait and stuff. So, so it's a lot of waiting and frustrating. And then you lose your context, basically a little bit. What's the opposite of go is, which is all about like quick feedback because the compiler is fast. Here, like you just lose your thing every time. And um, so the idea if when you run it locally, there is like a lot of uh, caching in, um, in Dagger, which makes like it really runs what it needs to. So basically you can get a feedback quite fast. And the other part that is nice is um, you can code it. So you can really have logic that is a little bit more complex than just like a few YAML. Because the problem is once your YAML is not enough, then you have to script some bash inside a YAML 
uh, to actually get more behavior that you want, but that you cannot test really. It's not that good because it's already like in that environment. Here, it's in a container environment that you control. So, and, and so they added uh, this feature that I was uh, waiting for before I left, which is called the uh, dagger functions now. And basically it's each, uh, you can create modules basically that you can import. And so for example, you have like a Terraform module. Well, basically it will be in Go because I think it's the, uh, if you, if you actually create like some uh, Terraform logic, you could, uh, you have the API in Go. So you would use that. And you can just make this module, make it testable by itself. And you can uh, take the Terraform module from your CI pipeline that you code in, I don't know, TypeScript or Python. And for example, you can use another module that would do training on data for uh, an LLM or whatever machine learning you have. And so you could like, but this will be in Python, for example. It wouldn't be in Go. And, um, and so then you can just import this Python module inside your TypeScript pipeline that also imports uh, another um, Terraform module to deploy your uh, model onto, onto uh, other machines. And all of this can be just in one pipeline, in one language, and each module is specialized in the language it's best at. And then like there is just uh, automatically, it will communicate uh, the API to, to send whatever module, whatever the module needs. And then basically it could, and, and then basically it constructs a, a DAG. That's why the name dagger, it constructs a DAG of uh, what needs to happen for the Terraform module to work with in conjunction with the other, in which order. And then when he has the DAG of all the interdependency of all the tasks and thing, it sends that to BuildKit and then BuildKit just runs the images and the containers uh, until he gets like the output. And then you can run that locally and then run the exact same thing in your CI because you already know it works. It's all containerized at some level. Okay, that makes sense because I've sat there with like 10 commits because I make this mistake or that mistake or I really don't know how it's going to behave in CI until I try it. So, okay, that's fair. That's fair. So why did you leave after a year and a half? Because that's, I guess, where you are now. Yes. So I was facing quite a lot of uh, uh, problems personally. And so it was hard for me to keep the, the, um, uh, the rhythm to work uh, with Dagger because um, we needed like to, to move fast and not break things. <laughs> and, uh, and so, yeah, so, so it was a, a tough period of my uh, time. And so we decided like to part ways because I need to figure some stuff personally. And so that's where I left. Yeah. But you could always go back once you feel like that's something that you can tackle again. Yeah. Yeah. I was actually even wondering maybe working in, um, um, also, maybe I was wondering if uh, I could do some um, dev uh, relationship uh, role more. Oh, DevRel stuff. Yeah, dude, you got so much experience right now. And you've got a great presence and you're very articulate. I think it would be a great role for you. I mean, it would be a lot of travel if, if you're ready to do that. So. so that's why, like, I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know exactly... Uh, uh, how to do and right now i'm i'm quite busy so so for now i put it on the back burner with all my thousand side projects <laughs> <laughs> but that's wild so um we're just about out of time but i'm i'm curious um you know you've been working in go as long as i have for for a little over a decade now is there any other sort of programming languages right now that are interesting to you that you're going to spend any time on or you think you still want to just stay sort of hedge down with go so okay um so as i said i have a thousand side projects that i would like to finish at some point or at least advance enough and basically all the mission that i've done throughout my career there was always uh, an end game my end game was basically create a video game uh, an MMORPG. I know it's passé now, but like this was the idea back in the day. And basically whenever I had like a new mission, I was like, how could this help me 
for creating an MMORPG because it's very complex to create an MMORPG with the distributed, the 3D and stuff like that. And, um, and so I started working on clustering to learn how I could cluster a video game server. I worked in 3D a little bit to know how, to, how does the 3D thing works and, and so on and so forth. Every time there was like a reason for me to discover this new domain and this new tech because maybe it could help me. And now I think I have gathered enough uh, knowledge to really start it. And, um, but it's still like a major overhaul to do and a lot of free time that I don't have. So it's still on the back burner, but now at least I feel confident in that. And I'm not so interested into dumping all my experience because basically I was like a jack of all trade. I guess I still am a jack of all trade. Um, but, uh, because I, yeah, I did the C sharp, Java, uh, Ruby, Python, uh, whatever, uh, ASP.net, VB script, VB, VB.net, etc. And so, uh, at some point like, yeah, maybe I would like to be like one of those people who really know their stuff about a language. And so I decided on go. Dude, that, that, that's a lot of programming languages that you've sort of learned over the years. So are you like geared up to learn another one? That's my question. <laughs> I don't think so because now I've invested so much time into Go. I've learned also a ton thanks to Go. Um, so there was Rust at some point, but I think Rust is still for me more performant and uh, more uh, memory safety oriented. And I'm like, Go is good enough on the memory safety and for the performance. I'm very satisfied with where Go is right now. Um, I hate when it's too slow, but Go is definitely not slow for me or not slow enough. So I'm happy with it. Uh, so I don't need Rust for that. And I also don't like the added complexity. I think the Bohr, um, uh, the Bohr checker is pretty cool. Um, but I don't think I need, I, I need that for the app that I want to do. I want to develop some high level app. I'm not like going for the kernel. I'm not going for very intensive performing stuff. So, and there was Zig. I know that a lot of uh, early gophers are also now early ziggers. And, um, and so I haven't looked at it that much, but again, like I, I have already so few time that basically I just want to build on my knowledge and my skills to create stuff and stop just learning. Now I would like to actually produce something. I have many apps that I want to do and stuff like that and my game and stuff. So, so yeah, now I want to build up of all this experience. So I, I love your story because it starts out where it's similar to mine, where just high school and college was just not, at least in the beginning, like it just wasn't feeling it. I had to do it because I had to do it. Didn't want to do it. it was kind of the times. Um, and even though you didn't go to the best university and do the things that everybody says is success, uh, you still found a very successful path uh, for your career, working on a lot of different sort of sectors and code and uh, some stuff. I bet you that people who even went to the best, highest, you know, quote unquote, best universities haven't even been able to work on. And I, and I, I love that part of your story because I think it's important for people to understand that you don't have to be worrying about going to the best named school and the best this or that. What you need to do is just follow your path and your journey and stay focused on the things you want to do and you'll get there, right? And if you uh, dance a little bit and you can balance the rest of your life out. <laughs> yeah. You can enjoy life. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. All right. We're totally out of time. Thank you for sharing your story with us. This was really cool for even me to uh, sort of catch up on. So if anybody after listening to this wants to reach out to you, and we'll put this in the show notes, uh, what's the best way for somebody to say hi and ask a question? Um, the best way would be Mastodon now because I'm trying to, to leave Twitter because different issues. Uh, so that would be Dolanor, uh, D-O-L-A-N-O-R at hackyderm.io and otherwise LinkedIn and uh, yeah, mostly that. Yeah. 
All right. Brilliant. We'll get that in the show notes. All right, everybody. This is Tungi and Bill Kennedy signing off from the Arn Labs podcast. We hope to see everybody again real soon. Bye.